This, this discussion will now be recorded. And this webinar is one of the series of events we will be hosting as AEN uh, as a build up to Evidence 2020 online. The webinar is the continuation of discussions we have had about capacity building over time. However, today it is based on the study that focused on the impact evaluation capacity in sub Saharan Africa. It highlights that there is a lot of capacity in Africa to do monitoring and evaluation and supports the case for sharing this capacity widely. And today we want to hear your views and your experiences about the topic as we move ahead in terms of going through um, our agenda. But however, before we, we, we delved into uh, the business of the day, the world is facing a new challenge today. We are being called to respond as individuals and communities the issues relating to COVID-19. AEN acknowledges that we are in this crisis and as an organization, we are called on to do and make a shift. As AEN, we've made that shift in terms of um, how we work. We now work all virtually, and now we're working also to shift our Evidence 2020 physical event to a full online event. And also we had launched um, a COVID-19 page to make sure that our members get an opportunity to share the evidence that they produce around COVID-19. So to make sure that people have access to different tools that they can use um, to work around COVID-19 um, as we are in that today. So I thought as the organization, we need to touch on that and not be um, oblivious around it. We sort of acknowledge what is happening around us and um, be ready to change the way we do things and how we work with one another. Thank you very much. Um, I think that was just a part of making sure that I give sort of a big overview and introduction to this webinar. And as we are about to start now um, on the agenda, the next item on the agenda is the introduction of um, goals of capacity building work stream that will be done by Ms. Charity Chisoro, my colleague. Charity, over to you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Charity Chisori and I'll briefly talk about um, the goal of the Capacities Workstream. So as the Capacities Workstream, the main goal is to share capacities um, across the EIDM ecosystem in Africa and um, for, for the conference Evidence 2020, which will be happening online, we we actually trying to uh, move away from the um, traditional way of looking at capacity, but looking at it differently in terms of capacity development. So we actually looking forward to kickstart some conversations uh, through this webinar as we discuss um, what we know already about impact evaluation capacity in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm really excited to have you uh, join us for this webinar and let's hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Charity, for sharing the goal um, of this webinar, where it falls, because it falls under your web stream. Thank you very much. And then we'll go along in terms of our agenda. The next item on the agenda um, relates to um, motivation for why we need to develop capacities differently, because that's something that as AEN we're trying to explore and see what are the best ways that are available, what are the different met methods or models that are available that we can use and share with one another, best practices that are available. I think um, as I was doing my introduction, I also uh, alluded to the fact that we've been having these conversations over time to make sure that we you know, find all these different um, methods in terms of how we can do and improve our capacity. I've highlighted that we had a workshop, Ruth and Beryl, I think, um, in one of the, the workshops highlighted that one of the EEM goals is about supporting evidence capacities in Africa and for Africa. 
through sharing resources and capacity development efforts. So that's something that we pursue and we make sure that we, we make um, efforts towards it as an organization. And also they reminded us about the history of AEN's engagement with one another about capacities for EIDM. So this conversation started, I think in 2017 at the AFRIA conference. So we moved this conversation from one conference to the other so that we advance those discussions as much as we can. And we are making sure that we're going to take it on um, to Evidence 2020 in Kampala. However, we're moving this to be online. Um, they also indicated nine issues, I think, around capacity um, approaches that came out of this conversation, namely that the agenda and priorities are driven by funders. And these approaches are short term. The training provided by so-called big institutions and individuals from the global north, they lack, there's lack of adaptation of training to local content, and there's limited use of adult learning principles and approaches, competition instead of collaboration, and the tick box activities, and then departing from an assumption that the policymakers are the ones selecting capacity for evidence use, forgetting that everyone else in the evidence ecosystem has something to teach, something to, to learn. So I think that is something that is important. So the series of the for the series of this webinar this year in particular, we want to um, accept these issues and need a need to change. And that is why we are highlighting them to make sure that we work together as different stakeholders across the continent who have interest in capacity that we make sure that we move um, these um, issues ahead. And then the motivation of the stream on the evidence capacity on this year's evidence 2020 that is going online is then to share and explore different ways and approaches and principles and tools and techniques um, how, on how to share capacity across the continent. And I think this alludes to the fact that to the fact that the presentation that charity has just done to strength to, to, to say what that work stream wants to achieve. So these are issues that are important within AEN and we want to make sure that we get um, inputs and lessons that other people have learned around issues that relate to capacity. So I think that is the motivation for us to do, to do this. We want an ongoing conversation that will lead us to a point where we feel we found different models that are suitable for, for, for South Africa because for, for Africa in particular. So I think that is something that is really important that we wanted to share with you. Um, I think that's what I wanted to share in terms of this. And I, I hope um, people, if they want to ask questions in between um, the, the presentations, can you please write on the chat? And then also we'll use the Q&A session for you to ask questions and engage um, with us. We don't want to lose the fact that, the, that you must engage with us, so we'll engage with us. So I think that, that was my the second uh, item on the agenda, the third item on the agenda that I just um, shared with you. So we'll move on to the fourth item on the agenda, which is um, the presentation that will sort of, you know, um, guide and drive the discussions also that we are going to have and also what has been um, introduced already. So I'll hand over to Yvonne and Sunet to give us um, the presentation. Thank you very much, Ziziwe, for the introduction. Um, my name is Yvonne Erasmus. Um, I think that we are, um, we'll all acknowledge that we are seeing some of the worst things um, in the world at the moment, but we're also seeing some great things and some incredible connections. And I am I'm noticing as people have been joining the, the webinar that um, there are those of you who are joining it from very different time zones than we are currently in and that have, that have had to get up very early for this. Um, so I thank you for that and I, I acknowledge um, your presence. And so Nate and I will be um, alternating um, presenting and we are obviously observing all social distancing rules during the lockdown and are in different locations. Um, it's also great for me to be able to see 
um, some members uh, who have uh, contributed to the project in some way. I've seen uh, Charity and I've also seen Lequa um, online, so I want to acknowledge their contributions as well. Um, can I have the first slide, please, uh, Karina? So Karina, okay, thank you very much. So just a little bit of background uh, to this study, why, um, how we came about to do this. So there's been a, a long held assumption that um, Africa has low levels of impact evaluation capacity and that when impact evaluations are conducted in the region, they are led and conducted by researchers from the global north. And that really links to um, post-colonial deficit models um, of the global south more generally or more broadly, and that there is a lack of human and institutional capacity to conduct impact evaluations uh, locally, and a suggestion that because much of the financial support comes from the global north, that local capacity might not be developed, um, especially in terms of leading impact evaluations and writing up findings for publication. Um, in other words, that local researchers are used more for routine uh, data collection uh, rather than uh, more systematic uh, skills uh, or longer term skills development. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other on the other hand, we also know that there is an Just increasing demand. Yes, okay. uh, sorry, we also know that there is increasing demand for. Uh, uh, attendees, please um, mute your microphones while the presentation is going, so that everyone can be able to hear the presentation. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Zewe. I didn't like this photo. If I'm presenting your name correctly, you are speaking to the group. Can you please mute your microphone? Thank you very much. So on the one hand, we have this um, notion of a deficit model, but on the other hand, we also know from practical experience that there's an increasing demand for evidence um, in Africa and for impact evaluations. And we also know that there are existing examples of high quality impact evaluations conducted in the continent. If we just look at JPL Africa, uh, for example, and the, the work that they've done and the high quality impact evaluations that they've pr produced. So knowing that there is evidence of locally conducted and led impact evaluations, we wanted to test the assumption of the deficit model and conducted a scoping study of impact evaluation in sub-Saharan Africa. And next slide, please, Karina. So the next slide, please. So the objective was to map impact evaluation uh, capacities to see where capacities in sub-Saharan Africa sit and uh, could be supported. And the study was commissioned and funded by the William and Flora uh, Hewlett Foundation. I've highlighted the word capacities there um, because I think I just want to briefly unpack what, what it is that we mean by that. And you'll see as we present our findings that we, we specifically looked at um, who has capacity to, uh, to publish um, impact evaluations, uh, who has capacity to conduct impact evaluations, and then we looked at um, who is developing capacity, um, in other words, where does the, the training uh, come from to support uh, the development of um, impact evaluation capacity. So it's those three elements, uh, um, publishing, conducting, and uh, training that we looked at. So uh, just to make clear what our definition of an impact evaluation um, is, and we, we used uh, the ULIT Foundation's definition. So we refer to a type of evaluation design that assesses the changes that can be attributed to a particular intervention. It's based on models of cause and effect and requires a credible counterfactual, sometimes referred to as a control group or comparison group, to control for factors other than the intervention that might ac account for the observed change. Next slide, please. Our project was supported by an advisory group um, of key stakeholders and specialists 
um, in the impact evaluation uh, field. For example, um, Paper Partnership for Economic Policy, JPL Africa, 3IE, um, Network for Impact Evaluation Researchers in Africa, NERA, uh, CLEAR AA, um, and the Economic and Social Research Foundation, um, etc. Um, so data collection took place between July 2018 and May 2019, um, and we finished the completed the report and was uploaded to the ACE and AN website at the end of last year. We used a, a multi-component design because we, we really wanted to reach widely. Um, and we therefore also trans triangulated uh, quite a lot. Um, and we used the different steps in the research process to, uh, to inform the next steps and who, who we approached, for example, for more in-depth interviews. So a multi-component design consisted of you know, semi-structured key stakeholder discussions or, or interviews, of which we did 14. So those were with uh, kind of the key stakeholders in the field on the current state of impact evaluation, where they think capacity sits, what are some of the barriers, um, and how capacity could be supported. We also conducted an online survey, um, which Sunet will talk about and then sampled from the online survey for follow-up interviews where we wanted to understand a bit more from those who uh, expressed that they have strong capacity to do impact evaluations. Uh, what were some of the, the factors that helped them to, uh, to develop that capacity and what more could be done? We also did a, a desk research on impact evaluation training resources that Tanet will talk about and an impact evaluation author search, which I will explain um, in a bit. Um, I'll state the limitations up front. Um, we did not investigate the funding landscape directly. Uh, Hewlett commissioned a, 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 a separate study looking at that specifically. Uh, we did not investigate uh, demand directly, although interview respondents did, did comment on their experiences of demand and linking up with policy makers and decision makers to get their impact evaluations used. Um, we made some judgments about who was local. I'll explain that um, when I talk about the author search. Uh, we looked at Sub-Saharan Africa, so we we're not able to comment on capacity in North Africa. And um, although we, we are able to comment on West Africa, um, ULIT, the ULIT Foundation commissioned a, a separate um, study as well, uh, or supported a separate study. Uh, conducted by uh, WASI, the West Africa Capacity Building and Impact Evaluation Program, looking specifically at both demand and supply in some um, of the Francophone uh, countries. So you'll see that there are a couple of studies that, that ran concurrently. Uh, next slide, please. So if we first look at um, the question of, so who has, what did we learn about capacity to author or to publish um, impact evaluations. So um, one of the things that we learned is that uh, impact evaluation practitioner, practitioners are not always incentivized to publish their work in, um, in peer review journals because not all impact evaluations are based at universities, although there is increasingly a funding, it is increasingly a funding requirement um, to at least publish one peer review uh, so at least have one peer review publication when when the grant is given. Um, but that that means that we we also might have missed some impact evaluation practitioners who have not published in peer review journals, uh, which is why we um, kind of triangulated what we found as well. So how we went about our author search, and it was it was a very interesting exercise uh, to do. As we so we conducted a, a detailed search of the three IEs impact evaluation repo repository because that's the most comprehensive uh, record of impact evaluations that have been published. And they also went through a very um, rigorous and systematic uh, search process and screening criteria um, in compiling the, the database. So that, that was our search to find out who, who had published on um, impact evaluations. So we found that um, 1,718 impact evaluations on Sub-Saharan Africa had been published between 1990 and 2015. Um, of these, 71% uh, 
had no African authors with African affiliations. And it's at this point that I, I want to, um, I need to explain that. Um, so the UDED Foundation was particularly interested in understanding um, local capacity. So local, so African authors with African affiliations. Uh, so where does the local capacity sit? Um, it was a bit tricky to do to determine and we did have to make some subjective, there was some su subjectivity um, in, in determining this, but we did try to follow um, some very clear criteria. Um, so we had to do a lot of, a lot of digging here because um, as you'll know, so if you find an academic publication, um, you know, first you have to find the publication and then you have to uh, use Google and, and LinkedIn and other resources to get a bit more information about, about the authors. So it was quite a time consuming process. So we, we excluded um, authors who were not based at a institutional affiliation that had uh, an address in Africa. Um, international organizations were included if the author um, was affiliated to the local, uh, the local branch. Um, but then, as I said, we used we had to use Google and LinkedIn to to learn a bit more about about the authors, to as, as far as possible um, try and assess who um, who African authors and local authors are uh, linked to African affiliations. Um, so the majority of the publications did not have any African authors with African affiliations, which I guess were expected. So the remaining 490 publications um, yielded 1,520 uh, unique African researchers who had been authored um, authors on peer-reviewed published impact evaluations. Um, so only 210 or 14 of, of the 1,520 were first authors, um, but also interestingly of the 490 publications for 68 articles or 14%, all of the authors were African. So there were no um, international um, collaboration um, on those papers at all, um, which, is, which is also very interesting. Um, so the fact that a number of authors were were first authors, and um, also that on some publications all of the authors were African. Um, you know, points to the existence of, of of the capacity to play a leading role in both the design and implementation um, of impact evaluations. So not just a, a data collection role. Um, so the next slide. So all of the all of the analysis now um, is based on the four or the subset of the 490 publications and the 1,520 unique African authors. Um, so this this slide um, illustrates the the capacity to author by geography. Um, so it's clear. I mean, South, South Africa has the most number number of authors, 307, and uh, number of first authors, 54, and then it goes down, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, um, et cetera. The, what's, what's interesting, um, there are a number of points that are interesting here, um, but for example, if you cross-reference um, the number of authors with the World Bank country classification by income level, that is all, all but South Africa are lower middle income or low income countries. Um, and that's we found interesting because it shows that the capacity to to publish impact evaluations does not correlate with kind of high high income status. Um, although we did not go into detail on who funded the impact evaluations. Um, a, a second point of interest in the the second block highlighted in 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 red is that it's really interesting to look at what happens at individual country level. And I would therefore really encourage you to look in detail at the the report because it is uh, our report is very detail heavy which I can't do um, at a high level presentation um, but it's it's interesting to see uh, to look at number of authors um, and to look at kind of number of first authors and percentage share of first authors so for example South Africa has quite a high number of um, of unique authors on publications, but uh, have a lower percentage share of first authors. 
17.6 then for example uh, Nigeria or Ethiopia that have fewer um, fewer number of authors but have a higher percentage share of of, um, of first authors um, next slide please um, and the next slide is really just a continuation um, of that uh, of the table um, that I won't go into a lot of detail with um, but yeah, I think you can you can follow that in the in the report um, as well. It's just a continuation of the, of the table showing capacity to uh, to author based on geography. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, so South Africa has the most impact evaluation researchers, 307, followed by Kenya, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, and Zambia. Uh, comparing region with first authors, East Africa had more first authors at, in 89 than Southern Africa. Um, South Africa has the most authors overall and um, more first authors. Um, and what was really interesting is that there was a number of researchers from West Africa were also first authors on, on publication. So um, Ghana, 16, Nigeria, 14, Burkina Faso, 6, etc. all indicated on the, the previous slide. The slide you're currently seeing indicates um, the capacity uh, by, by region and the number of countries um, that that is spread across. Uh, next slide, please. The next slide shows uh, the capacity to author impact evaluations by um, institution, which was also interesting to us. There's a, a caution here that um, this is data from 1990 to 2015, so the people might not be at the same institution um, anymore. So, um, it's clear that uh, Bakarera University in, in Uganda um, had the most number of, and those are kind of unique uh, authors, uh, followed by South African Medical Research Council, University of Zimbabwe, Bits University. Um, so the next slide has the has a continuation of that of that uh, table. Karina, you can go to the to the next slide, just if people want to. Uh, to have a look at the table and then I'll make um, a, so one, one slide before that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So it's just a, a continuation of the table and I'll, I'll make my points while you look at it. So it's that we found that a large amount of research capacity reside within schools of public health and health science faculties at university institutions. The Makarere University in Uganda had the greatest number of researchers in 66 at an institution. And um, four of the top 10 institutions with the most number of researchers were from South Africa. So South African Medical Research Council, Wits University, Cape Town, uh, Human Sciences Research Council, etc. Um, the slide that I want to present on next um, is about capacity to author impact evaluations by sector. If you could bring that up, Karina, please. The, um, and that really, uh, so the, the sectors, ref next, yeah, thank you. The, so the sectors reflected here um, is how they appear on the, um, the 3A impact evaluation repository. Um, and it's clear that there is a, kind of a disproportionate number of publications in the health and health nutrition and population sphere which could might also link to what the um, the funding landscape uh, looks like across sectors. Um, I will now mute my microphone and hand over to Sunet to present to present the next couple of slides and then I will give some concluding comments. Thank you Sunet. Thank you Yvonne. Um, Karina, can you please go to the next slide, please? So my component of the study focused basically on question two and question three. Um, question two was for us, who else has capacity to conduct um, impact evaluations? And to answer this part of the study, um, we conducted an online survey 
and we had 353 responses uh, for the survey. So on this slide, you will just see a number of statistics with regards to our um, respondents. Um, the majority of our respondents, and this was very positive for us, 93.5%, um, are currently based in Africa, and almost 93, 92.9% are citizens of an African country. Now, this is very encouraging because this tells us that the people who responded to our survey with regards to impact evaluation capacity are people based within Africa. So we had responses from people within Africa who's telling us if we have capacity beyond what we've seen with our publications to conduct impact evaluations. Um, the people who responded to our sector, 55% are based in the academic sector, 24% are working for government, and 32% work for think tanks and NGOs. Um, another very encouraging component from our respondents is that 77% of them have been involved in conducting impact evaluations. And this gave us a really substantial basis to draw our conclusions from. Because once again, it tells us that the people who responded have been involved in impact evaluations in Africa. Can we have the next slide, please, Karina? Um, so, who's, who else have capacity to conduct impact evaluations? Um, like I've said, 24% of our survey, survey respondents were from government departments. 13.5% um, of our survey respondents have conducted impact evaluations within these government departments. And this was also very interesting because um, what we have seen with the publications that Yvonne has just discussed is we have seen what is what's the ability within institutions such as universities, but now we've also seen that within government departments in African countries, um, there's also capacity to conduct impact evaluations. Um, so what we have done with specifically with this component of the study is if people responded that they are aware of organizations who's got capacity to conduct impact evaluations. We triangulated this um, with what we've seen in our study on the publications. And an organization had to be uh, mentioned twice, at least, by respondents to be included in this component of our capacity search. So this has shown to us that um, there's a large number of organizations beyond universities that also have capacity to conduct impact evaluations. Um, the full list of this is available in the report, and you'll see in the chat component of this presentation, um, we have already um, sent you a link to where you can find the full report of this. Um, in the report, you will see a very nice map where we have looked at specific countries and then highlighted institutions there um, that has got capacity to conduct impact evaluations. And what you will see that's very important for us, that this is more than just academic institutions, but there's a number of other institutions that also have capacity. Um, we have also divided the organizations within regions, Eastern, Western, and Southern Africa, um, and then, for us, one of the most important components is to identify organizations that have conducted more than 10 impact evaluations. And in uh, quite a few countries, we've got organizations who have conducted more than 10 impact evaluations. This includes Benin, Burundi, the DRC, Kenya, Malawi, um, Cameroon, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, Tanzania, and Uganda. And this is really encouraging to see the number of impact evaluations that, that has been done. Um, can we get to the next slide, please, Karina? So our next question was then, who provides impact evaluation training? Now, this was a very interesting question to ask, and we've answered this question with two parts. We have drawn from our survey results 
and we looked at what our respondents said there. And then we've also conducted a desk review um, where we looked at the type of training that's available on impact evaluation within Africa and who did what type of impact evaluation training. So a total of almost 68% of our survey respondents indicated that they have received impact evaluation training over the past 10 years. But then we have to break down, what does impact evaluation training mean? Do we talk about capacity building? Do we talk about workshops? Do we talk about accredited training um, degrees? What is impact evaluation training? The majority is short attendance courses, about 57%. And this is short courses um, that is not necessarily accredited, and they can be anything from two days long to up to about 10 days in total. Um, the majority of people who've received proper impact evaluation training at universities have indicated that they have received this training at universities outside of Africa. And that's about 40% of our respondents. Um, this includes a large number of universities in Europe, as well as quite a few universities within the US. Um, next slide, please, Karina. Um, so for our desk review, we really investigated um, where is the accredited courses. Um, so what we have found is that there is very few courses that focus on impact evaluation specifically. The majority of accredited courses that's got a, a, a qualification linked to it is focusing on monitoring and evaluation in general and not necessarily on impact evaluation specifically. Um, there is quite often an impact evaluation um, module or component into it, um, but it's not that the course focus only on impact evaluations. Um, workshops and non-accredited course, short courses are generally presented by academic institutions, international organizations, and a number of NGOs. A full list of this is also available um, within our uh, final report that's available on our website. Um, Yvonne, over to you again. Apologies, I'm talking to myself. I did not unmute my microphone. <laughs> um, thank you for that, Sunit. Um, yes, so really our, our final question, um, that's quite difficult to present in a lot of, of, of um, of detail here and where I would really encourage you to go to the report is so if we look at at the the components we that the study looked at if we look in a combined fashion at um, who has capacity to author who has capacity to conduct but but might not um, really be that prolific in in publishing um, impact evaluations and where is training being provided if we look at all of those three components overall, uh, where appears to be the evidence of most capacity? And I would encourage you to look at, at our report because we, we break it down for each and every country in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, what, what did we find in terms of publishing, in terms of training, and in terms of uh, capacity to conduct impact evaluations, but if we if we look at the the four uh, kind of four regions really, then in, in East Africa, uh, it's the, the evidence of most uh, capacity appears to be centered around Uganda, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Kenya. Um, in Southern Africa, it appears to be around South Africa. In Central Africa, in Cameroon, and then in West Africa. It's uh, spread across Benin, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, and uh, Senegal. Um, next slide, please, Karina. So there's clearly strong evidence of capacity in Southern and Eastern Africa, um, and in schools of public health and faculties of health at universities. It's clearly a disproportionate capacity in the health sector. 
337 authors across 14 countries in West Africa um, have published impact evaluations indicating growing capacity in this sub-region. Of the 48 African countries investigated, we found evidence that impact evaluation training has been offered in 32 of these countries, indicating more impact evaluation training opportunities that, um, than anticipated. Um, but as Sunet indicated, respondents to the survey indicated that formal accredited training in impact evaluations is mostly presented at universities outside of Africa, um, and especially for, for them, particularly at uh, European universities. Um, so the ne next slide, please, Karina. And um, what are our key takeaways? If, I, if we go back to the beginning and what the, the background and objectives of the study were. So I think our findings confirmed that, that much of the impact evaluations published on Sub-Saharan Africa have been conducted by researchers from the Global North, as evidenced by the 1,718 impact evaluations published between 1990 and 20 in 2015, where 71% did not have any, any African authors with African affiliations. However, we did find more evidence of capacity by local researchers to publish and conduct impact evaluations than has been widely assumed to exist, and we were very pleasantly surprised. Um, so we identified 1,520 unique African researchers with African affiliations across 37, sorry, 34 different countries who've authored 419 impact evaluations. And 14% of those, on 14% of those publications, all of the authors were African, um, indicating nascent local capacity. Um, next slide, please, Karina. Our final thoughts and recommendations. So, that's, so local experience in impact evaluation does exist across sub-Saharan Africa, especially in health and nutrition. And it is important that funders should draw on this rather than the default being to bring in um, experts from the global north. The, there's clearly scope exists to build impact evaluation capacity in sectors other than health. Um, it's important that we found the importance of collaboration and opportunities to connect both across continents and on, on the continent. Um, it could be argued that the local capacity that does exist um, in Africa has been built over many years through uh, cross-continental collaboration and training opportunities and it is therefore important we think for that to continue to exist but it is equally important uh, for in local um, local networking opportunities and local networks um, to bring local impact evaluation evaluators together it was an interesting finding for us during um, although more anecdotal but conducting some of some of our interviews um, and I guess we all know this, or those of us who work in a university environment will know this, that, that very often there are um, people in, in your institution or in a different part of the university um, that have a similar skill set that you are completely unaware of. And we found something very similar in our interviews that researchers at the same institution, um, all of whom have impact evaluation capacity did not know that, that the other party existed. So there's definitely something to say about uh, local connectivity and it's great to, to see like, the work of, of NERA, the network of impact evaluation researchers in Africa that could pick up on this. Um, we also uncovered something about the importance of language and understanding existing capacity, uh, particularly um, in, in French speaking Africa and it would be Franco yeah, Francophone African, it'd be um, interesting. I think we have some uh, participants of the webinar from that part of the world to further comment on this. Because um, what, what we have heard is, is that uh, from interviews um, uh, done with um, impact, impact evaluation practitioners in that region, is that the, some feel that they are at a disadvantage of accessing funding opportunities because funders are not able to assess and evaluate proposals written in French and that uh, people are at a disadvantage if they have to feel forced to write proposals in, in English. So that came up as a barrier, um, language is a barrier in developing uh, capacity. And then finally that accessing training opportunities should of course be accompanied by further support and, and opportunities within institutions 
uh, to to mentor people and for the support their capacity as training on its own is is not enough. Um, then our final slide, if you wanted to to learn more, um, our full report is available both on the AN website under learning spaces, but also on the on the ACE website. And if you go to the ACE website, in addition to the to the report that breaks down all of our findings by country, there are two annexures. One of them uh, sets out or details all of the training opportunities that we found. And uh, the other annexure uh, details the names of all of the organizations that we found um, th that have published um, impact evaluations. We were only able to highlight some uh, in the presentation. And then finally, the ULED Foundation has done a, a wonderful kind of research brief on the, on the project that's available on their website if you want to uh, have a look at that. Um, I will now hand back to, to the chair, um, but I, I do, um, I've noted two points that have come up in the discussion or in the, in the chat, uh, Madam Chair, that I don't know if you want to afford opportunity for people to comment. Um, there's been questions about the, the uh, WASI study uh, that focused particularly on Francophone Africa, whether we know um, anything about those findings. I did comment in the chat that we haven't seen the report, um, but it might just be worth checking whether anyone from 3IE who was involved in that work is online and whether they want to comment. Um, and um, also whether anyone from uh, Francophone um, Africa who's on the line want to comment on um, impact evaluation uh, capacity in that region as there's also been a question about uh, what more do we know uh, around um, impact evaluation practitioners working um, and publishing specifically in French. Um, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very Hi, much, Yvonne. Um, Yvonne and Sunet. Hi. Can you please introduce uh, yourself and then give your comment? Thank you. Uh, yes. Hi, Yvonne. This is Anka Dumitrescu from 3AE. Um, I head up the WASI program. And so I wanted to uh, jump in on your invitation and just provide a few um, a few points. Um, the report is available currently on our website. It is available in English and in French. Um, and that is at uh, the website for WASI and the website for, for 3IE. Um, and our website is uh, 3ieimpact.org. And so if you go there and type in WASI, W-A-C-I-E, it will bring you to the WASI page and you'll be able to find a report for anyone who's interested in reading those findings. Um, also, our findings in West Africa echo a lot of the information that was presented during the seminar um, in the sense that there, we have found that there is capacity, uh, but that is not very well tied together. We also found that there's a lot of great interest in impact evaluation, um, but the capacity is not as developed as in East Africa and in South Africa. Um, language, of course, is, is a barrier. Um, and so having resources in French and having proposals and funding in French is much more limited than it is in English. Um, one of the things that we are trying to work with the program is actually to bridge that gap. And one of the things that we're working with the WASI program also is to standardize and harmonize the language that we use around impact evaluation. Um, we found in our study that many times people talk about impact evaluation, but the definitions of what we define as an impact evaluation and their definition of impact evaluation was, was quite different. And oftentimes we were talking about different methods or, or different experiences. So one of the things that we were, were really trying to, to work on is making sure that we harmonize how we talk about uh, the definitions of the terminology. Um, in addition, we, we, did, we focused a lot on government capacity and we focused a lot on policymakers and their demand for it. And so with the WASI program, we actually work to help policymakers understand and better make uses of evidence. And so that is one of the big scopes of, of the WASI initiative and focus. So I'll stop right there, um, and, but let me know if you have any questions. 
Uh, thank you very much, Anka. Thank you very much, Yvonne and um, Sunet, for the great presentation. And thank you, Anka, for also linking um, the two studies um, together. So we'll give an opportunity um, to people who have inputs or comments. We have only five minutes to spare. So I'll take a round of three questions or comments, and then the presenters will have an opportunity to respond to your question. So if you have a question, unmute, unmute, unmute yourself and introduce yourself and then share your question or input. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, hello. hello. Oh. Good, okay. Good morning. Uh, hey, oh, Sergio, okay. speak. Okay, you can go first and then I'll go second. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Yvonne, and uh, okay. all the team who organize uh, these interesting discussions. Um, my name is Serge Rick, and um, I'm, all my job, you know, is in evaluations, including impact evaluations, mostly in Africa, both francophone and English-speaking part of the Africa. So when listening to the presentations, I think uh, the debate is coming back again on the table because we should acknowledge, you know, different parameters, either for impact evaluation itself and also for capacity. Because uh, the issue about capacity continue being raising for the time. So it's been uh, working in more than 24 African countries. Uh, I, I really come into the conclusion like, you know, the issue about capacity doesn't depend mostly about the interest of the institution. It's not rather by the interest of those who are looking for impact evaluation or by the capacity in evaluation. For instance, an example, I'm leading an evaluation book in Faso on uh, early child development, coupled with another evaluations on the social protections. But at the beginning, UNICEF was raising the concern about capacity in Burkina Faso. But what was missing is about those who have capacity about UNICEF rule in doing evaluation, rather than uh, capacity in conducting the evaluation in social protection. So we should make a distinction about institutions' policy to do evaluation as compared to what is needed to do evaluations. So this conclusion was also made when we went when we moved to Ethiopia and uh, Burundi four years ago with the Mastercard Foundations. The approach was openly done, but we strongly recommend to use local approach to do impact evaluation rather than applying the, the most common classical or Western approach to impact evaluation. So, so we should make decisions about, uh, on those approach and techniques when we set about capacity and other how we're doing impact evaluation. I even like the way we present normal institutions, uh, you know, the figures about the um, availability or country where we have a lot of impact evaluation. South Africa, for instance, is new, it's not new for everyone. We know that in South Africa, most of international institutions are governing evaluation in South Africa. And then it also linked to the donor interest to do evaluation. So maybe I should be brief and then just to say that uh, we should go back to those parameters. I mentioned the context, I mentioned the culture, I mentioned also the day-to-day uh, -day life of people, indigenous community doing evaluation. So they don't even have to showcase about this. But anyway, I really like it. I think we should continue the debate. We need more discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Eric. Hey, Masako, you are next after him. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Masako Tabani. I work for the Grasha Marshall Trust as a ME monitor evaluation assistant. And um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I guess probably I have three should I say two reflective comments and then just one question. So I'll go with the first um, question to say, okay, we hear that the heading of the presentation is what do we know about this lack of impact evaluation capacity? Then my question is, so what? Because I feel like we have been presented something that we are aware of, or is it because at a time when this data collection was conducted, I was also part of KAA and also KAA was doing something around that. So what is AIS proposing differently? That will be my question. And then um, the second probably a reflection that I saw through seeing the presentation, I saw that probably there was no um, acknowledgement around collaboration issues, should I say, in terms of government vis-a-vis -vis with NGOs, because as much as government may not conduct impact evaluations independently, 
but did you take account of those to say as much as they outsource some of their functions to NGOs to conduct those evaluations in partnership with them? Does that mean then there's no capacity in that level or how do you go around that, yes, that space? And then um, also the third one is on, um, now that we are faced with this mist of COVID-19, and I think it's like being exaggerated as well. I mean, we are all know aware of it. And then the question will be around now that ACE has told us about this lack of capacity, is there a different way of ACE then providing, should I say, intervention? or competencies around this and uh, filling the gaps of yeah in terms of this impact even so, yeah those are my thoughts and, yeah um thank yes. you very much eric and maseho um because of time i'll give back to yvonne and sunet to give um response to those questions and then anyone else who have a question um that we are not going to be able to address now or input can they please send it to ace at uj dot ac dot za then we'll be able to take time to answer those questions over to you yvonne and uh, sunet uh, thank you very much uh, for the uh, questions and very insightful comments uh, that's also continued in the chat box um i just want to clarify something i don't think the presentation was about the lack of capacity i think the presentation was was about quite the opposite um, it was about highlighting the, um, the incredible capacity that does exist and that there is more capacity than we actually know or that we actually assumed. So I'd like to challenge the idea that the presentation was highlighting the lack of capacity. That was, uh, that was not what we were trying to do. Um, in terms of, of the, the so what and how this links to other studies, I think that... Um, our advisory group uh, agreed with us on the on the need to um, to summarise and to explore what it is that is out there. Um, yes, other work uh, has explored similar topics. We also have the WASI study on West Africa in particular. Um, but I do think that this is a um, even if it does present some of what we already know that um, this is a comprehensive and uh, substantive inventory that people can draw on um, and it highlighted organizations that uh, might not be obvious that are um, functioning in the impact evaluation space. Um, I Sorry, I didn't, couldn't get the question on COVID-19, um, but I'll leave it to the AN to, or to Sunet to respond um, on that if they were able to get the question. Uh, thank you everyone. I'll hand over to Sunet. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I couldn't hear the COVID-19 question either, but what I could gather from what Maseho asked is, is there any um, intention from the AEN side to focus on impact evaluation training? Um, Maseho, is, am I right? Is that what you asked? And also, what would be the competences around those? Yes. Um, Karina, can I ask you as our capacity lead if you've got anything to talk to about capacity development? Yeah, well, yes, I'm happy to do so. Um, um, I have a question specifically about the AEN and our intention to do training of capacity in general. Um, the Secretariat of the AEN, we see our major role in capacity development and sharing not to be the providers of the training, but to really enhance sharing of trainings that do exist and, in, and enhancing collaborations and connections to ensure wider work on that. So as an AEN, we don't see ourselves doing the conducting the training and, and doing training and developing courses on impact evaluation, but definitely would gladly collaborate with those that are doing it to put put one another in connection with others who's doing it and that we learn from one another about that. 
I think that as an ANC secretariat, that's that's what we see our role. Um, in terms of ACE specifically, um, we are looking at various kinds of training options, but our own in ACE, our own expertise doesn't really lie in impact evaluation. And I think you know we we look at our immediate neighbours around Bits and Clear, for example, to do those kinds of training. And that's it from Isisiwe. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I think we are out of time now. Just to, to wrap it up, thank you very much to all the people that attended um, this webinar. Thank you very much, Sunet and um, Yvonne, for presenting. Um, thank you so much. We um, Just the closing remarks, the slides and the recording will be available to all participants. And if you have more questions and you want to interact with us more, please send us an email to ace at uj.ac.za or um, connect with us to all our social media platforms. We'll be happy to continue um, this conversation until our next webinar. And uh, just from AEN side, please be safe and practice social distancing. Thank you very much. Um, we, I am adjourning um, the webinar. Looking forward to meeting you again on our next webinar. Thank you so much for participating. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye-bye. Bye. 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 That's so much. Bye. Yeah, interesting. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.